hi guys my name is vuvu and this is vuvu vena reads welcome back to my channel um today we are doing another first chapter friday and for today's book i have picked the sweetness of water which still has a bargain books sticker Ciao. the sweetness of water by nathan harris um better than any debut novel has a right to be that is what richard russo says if you know anything about me you'll know that i'm a sucker for debuts so hey and i did pick this one up from bargain books as you can see for 79 rand and how i feel about the cover is that it looks like this is gonna be one of those if this looks for me this gives me plant plantation i almost say plantain plantation uh a plantation feel to it and I absolutely love the color choices. This orange against this brown is, is beautiful. And I think the text really works. So I don't have any um, thing bad to say about the cover. Absolutely love it. The author looks fine. And how I might add, okay, I don't know if this, like my camera usually just fails me when it comes to this. But that is Nathan. And um, Brett Anthony Johnston says, I cannot recall such an a short accomplished or extraordinarily imagined de debut sorry a writer with impossibly rare talents and still rarer hearts okay then um the synopsis reads in the dying days of the american civil war newly freed brothers landry and prentice find themselves cast into the world without a penny to their names forced to hide out in the woods near their former georgian plantation okay they're soon discovered by the landowner george walker a man still reeling from the loss of his son in the war when the brothers begin to live and work on george's farm the tentative bond of trust and union begin to blossom between the strangers but this sanctuary survives on a knife's edge and it isn't long before the inhabitants of the nearby town of old ox react with fury at the alliances being formed only a few miles away conjuring a world fraught by tragedy and violence they yet Threaded through with hope, the sweetness of water is a debut novel unique in its power to move and enthrall. This is what the synopsis says. So, um, this one was published for anyone who's curious last year, which is 2021. The first chapter is 10 pages long, and without any further chit chat, let me just delve into that. Okay. So, Bubabena underscore reads is an amazing book reviewer also youtuber she reviews books on youtube and if i'm not mistaken she also has a blog as well so please if for your connection with literature get in touch with or follow at v u v u v e n a underscore reads she is based in south africa and i think it is also extremely important to follow literary content creators who are based outside of who are based outside of the west and in continental africa because they do a really good job of Bridging the gap. We appreciate you, Vuvu, for bringing us turning pages and for bringing us your booktube channel. You know, this is a chance for people to actually see some people that I really enjoy. Please consider pressing the red subscribe button down below. And if you are returning, welcome back, fam. Vuvu, you're amazing. Thank you so much for your time. The font is not bad, right? It's not as big as, um, let's say, Yinka that I showed you last week. But it's really not horrible either um so i feel like as soon as we can let's just get into it okay uh okay i just want to see if i'm missing anything else i could tell you about this so this one doesn't have a prologue or anything like that it delves straight into chapter one which is what we're going to do chapter one an entire day had passed since george walker had spoken to his wife He'd taken to the woods that very morning, tracking an animal that had eluded him since his childhood, and now night was falling. He'd seen the animal in his mind's eye upon waking, and tracking it carried a sense of adventure so satisfying that all day he could not bear the thought of returning home. This had been the first of such excursions all spring, and trapping through splintered splintered pine needles and mushrooms swollen from the morning rain he'd come upon a patch of land he'd yet to explore in full the animal he was sure was always one step away from falling into his line of sight 
the land his father had passed down to him was over 200 acres. The large red oaks and walnut trees that surrounded his home could dim the sun into nothing more than a, sh a soft flicker in the sky passing between their branches. Many of them as familiar as signposts long studied over many years from childhood on. The brush George encountered was waist high and coated with burrs that clung onto his trousers. He'd developed a hitch over the last few years, had pine had pinned it on a miss place step as he descended from his cabin to the forest floor but he knew this was a lie it had appeared with the persistence and steady progress of old age itself as natural as the lines on his face the white in his hair it sh slowed him and by the time he caught his breath and took a moment to assess his surroundings he realized that silence had overtaken the woods the sun above his head only moments before had faded into nothingness over the far corner of the valley, nearly out of sight. Albie. He had no idea where he was. His hip ate as though something was nestled there and attempting to escape. Soon the need for water overtook him. The floor of his mouth so dry his tongue clung to it. He took a, a seat on a small log and waited for total darkness if the clouds gave out the the stars would appear which was all he needed to map his way back home his worst miscalculation would still guide his, him to ox, old ox and although he loathed the idea of seeing any of those sorry desperate sorts in town at the very least one of them would offer a horse to return him to his cabin for a moment, the thought of his wife came to him. By now, he was typically arriving home. The candle Isabel had left on the windowsill, guiding his final few steps. She would often forgive these absences of his. Only after a long, silent hug, the black ink from the trees leaving faint handprints on her dress, irritating her all over again. The log, be the log beneath him yawned and george's rear end sank into the okay the lock beneath him yawned and george's rear end sank into the waterlogged mess only as he moved to stand to pat himself dry did he see them sitting before him two negroes similar in dress white cotton shirts unbuttoned breeches as ragged as if they'd fitted their legs into intertwined gunny sacks they stood stock still and if the blanket before them had not swayed in the wind like some flag to signal their presence, they might have disappeared in the foreground entirely. The closer one spoke up. We got lost, sir. Don't mind us. We'll be moving on. They came into, cl into clearer focus and it was not the words that struck George, but what the young man was but that the young man was precisely the age of his Caleb, that he and his companion were trespassing was besides the point entirely. In the nervous chatter of his voice, the eyes that darted, that darted like those of an animal hiding from prey, the young man gained George's sympathy, perhaps the only morsel of it left in an otherwise broken heart. Where is it that, where is it you two come from? where mr morton's well was ted morton was a dimwit a man who if offered a fiddle would be as liable to smash it against his own head to hear the noise as put a bow to its string he passed his parcel of land bordered george's and when it an issue arose a runaway most often the ensuing spectacle rife with armed overseers and large snout dogs lanterns of such illumination that they kept the entire household awake was so unpleasant that george often deferred all communications with the family to isabel just to avoid the ordeal but to find morton's former property on his land now carrying with it a welcome now carried with it a welcome irony irony emancipation had made the buffoon helpless to their wanderings and for all his great shows of might these two men were now free to be as lost as george was in this very instance 
Our apologies, said the man in front. They began to bundle up their blankets, collect a small knife, a bit of stripped beef, pieces of bread, but stopped once George started started in again. His eyes wandered the ground in front of him as if searching for something lost. I've been following the beast of some size. A beast of some size, he said, black in color, known to stand on two feet, but usually found on four. It's been years since I saw the creature with my own two eyes, but I often take wake to its image. I often wake to its image as if it's trying to alert me to its presence nearby. Sometimes on my porch, I'll be dozing off and the memory of it is so strong, so clear that it travels through my head like an echo bound through my dreams as as far as tracking it, I'm afraid to say it's gotten the upper hand. The two men looked at one another, then back at George. That's, well, that's mighty curious, the smaller one said. In the last remnants of light, George could make out the smaller one, a man whose eyes were so placid and displayed so little emotion that he seemed simple. His lower jaw was cracked open wide revealing a hanging slab of teeth it was the other one the smaller one who continued to do the talking george asked them their names this here is my brother landry i'm prentice prentice did ted come up with that oh did ted come up with that prentice looked at landry as if he might have a better idea i don't know sir i was born with that name it was either him or the missus I imagine it was Ted. I'm George Walker. You wouldn't happen to have some water, would you? Prentice handed over a canteen and George understood he was expected to ask after them, investigate why they were here on his land. But the issue took up such a small space in his thinking that it felt like a waste of what energy he had left. The movement of other men in interested him so little that the indifference was his chief reason for living so far from society as was so often the case his mind was elsewhere i get the sense you've been out here some time you wouldn't you wouldn't have happened to have seen that animal i spoke of Prentice studied George for a moment until George realized the young man's gaze was trained past him somewhere off in the distance can't say i have mr norton Oh, I can't say I have. Mr. Norton had me on some of his hunting trips. I've seen all sorts of things, but nothing like you described. Mostly fowl. Those dogs come back with the birds with the birds still quivering in their mouths. And he'd have me string them to the other and carry them home on my back. I had so many you couldn't see me through the feathers. Other boys would be jealous I've got to go off for the day but they didn't know the first thing about it i'd rather be in the field than have that load on my back that's something george said considering the image that's really something landry pulled apart a chunk of meat and handed it to prentice before taking one for himself don't be rude now prentice said landry looked over to george and motioned to the meat but george declined with a shake of his head they sat in silence and George found their evasion, aversion to speak, to speaking welcome. Other than his wife, they seemed like the only individuals he'd come upon in some time who would rather leave a moment naked than tied with wasted words. This is your land then, Prentice finally said. My father's land, now mine, one day it was to be my son's. The words fell away into the night and he began again on a different course. Now it's got me turned around and I don't even know which way is what and these damn clouds in the sky. He sensed the woods themselves taunting him and went to stand as if in protest only for the pain in his hip to call itself into a tighter knot. With a yelp he fell back on to the log. Prentice stood and walked over to him, concerning his eye. What, what, what do you go and do to yourself? Um, all that yelling and carrying on. If you knew what hell this day has been, you might yell yourself. Prentice was near him now, so close George could smell the sweat on his shirt. Why was he so still, so suddenly unnerving? If you wouldn't mind at least being quiet for me, Mr. Walker, he said, please. George recalled the knife that he had recalled the knife 
that had been beside the half wood with such urgency it it nearly materialized in the darkness and he realized that the that and he realized then that beyond the confines of a household lost in the woods he was simply one man in the presence of two and that he had been a fool to assume his own safety what is this about my wife will be calling for help any moment you do know that don't you but the two men's frozen desperate gazes were once again not on him but beyond him a whipping sound broke out as at George's side and he turned to find a rope and the counterweight of a large rock beside it. The makings of a fine-tuned snare holding the legs of a jackrabbit writhing, writhing a few feet along the way. Landry rose up faster than George might have thought possible and gave his attention over to the rabbit. Prentice took a step back and waved off the movement. The moment, okay. Yeah, the moment. I didn't mean to worry you, he said. We just, we ain't had something land in that trap yet. We ain't had a proper meal in some time, is all. I see, George said, collecting himself. Then you've been out here longer than I first thought. Prentice explained then that they had departed from Mr. Morton's a week ago and had taken what little they could carry on their backs. A sickle left in the fields, a bit of food, the bed roll, the bed rolls from their pallets and had not made it any further than where they stood now he said he would he said he could take a few times he said we could take a few things from the cabins prentice said of morton's minor generosity we ain't stealing a thing no one said anything about stealing not that i would care he has more than a simple tin like him could ever make use of i just wondered why really you could go anywhere we plan to it's just nice. What's that? Prentice took, looked at George as if the question was right before him. To be left alone for a time. Landry ignored them and chopped the loose bits of an oak tree limb in, into feed for a fire. Isn't that why you out here yourself, Mr. Walker? George was shivering now. He began to speak of the animal, how it had led him here but the sound of Landry's chopping interrupted his train of thought and he found himself as had been the case since the pre preceding day reflecting on his son when the boy was younger they had walked these very woods together chopping wood and making a play of such things as if a hearth permanently aflame was not awaiting them at home with that memory the others streamed forth the small moments that had bonded the two putting him to bed praying with him at the table, empty gestures with winks passed from one to the other like whispered secrets, wishing him off to the front with a handshake that would have been so much more until they dissolved in the face of the boy's best friend, August, having come to visit him that very morning with news of Caleb's death. They'd met in George's small study. August looked very much like his father, the same blonde hair, the boyish features and the air of vague regality rooted in little but family folklore. August and Caleb had left old ox in their clean butternut greys and polished boots and George expected his son to return a muddied threadbare savage, foresaw him and himself and Isabel as the dutiful parents who would nurse him back to normalcy. In light of this, something felt indecent about August's evening wear the frocked shirt the press waistcoat with the gold time timepiece hanging freely it appeared as if he'd already discarded his time at war and this meant caleb too had become part of the past long before george had even known his son was gone from him forever while august sat across from george's desk george himself could only bear to stand at the window August informed him that he'd been injured, a bad tumble on patrol that had led to his discharge only a few week, only a week earlier, the first day of March. He looked perfectly healthy to George, who figured the boy's father had paid to see him to safety as the war in its last throes grew more dangerous. 
but his suspicion weighed nothing against what it was that had brought them to this moment, this room. And so August began to speak, and even with his first utterance, George gasped the hollowness of the boy's words, the theatrics of his delivery, could picture him in his roundabout, coming to his proper to his property, going over each sentence, each syllable, for the greatest possible effect. He told George that Caleb had served honorably and had and had welcomed death with honor and courage, that God had willed him a peaceful passing. Caleb had been going off with this boy since they were both so young that neither reached George's mind midsection. He recalled a time they'd run into the woods to play, only to return with Caleb so mortified, August so filled with glee, that George took the contrast as the result of some competition, an occasion that might lend itself to a moral lesson. Take your losses like a man now, George had said. But later, when Caleb, Caleb could not sit for dinner, winced even in consideration of doing so, George pulled the boy's trousers down. Slash marks, some still flushed with blood, the others bruised to a deep purple covered his backside. He told George of the game August had hatched Master and the Slave, and they had only been assuming their proper roles for the afternoon. The pain was not from the marks, Caleb went on, but from the fact that he could not conceal them and that George might tell August's father. He had to wear he had to swear to the boy that he would keep it secret. Standing in his study, George sighed and made it clear to August that he knew he was lying. His son could lay claim to many traits, but bravery was not one of them. This single comment was all it took for the varnish of August's act to peel away. He stumbled over his words, crossed his leg, checked his timepiece, desperate for an exit that George would not provide. No, no, his son had died, and he, des he deserved to know the truth of what had happened. George had not seen Landry start the fire before him, but light from the flame overtook their but light from the flame overtook their corner of the forest and cast the big the bigger man in relief. He retrieved the skinned rabbit and pitted the body the bloody mess on the end of a shaped branch of for roasting. The clouds had parted and the sky was full of stars so clear, so magnificent, it was as if they'd been arranged just for the three of them. I should be heading home, George said. My wife will be worried. If you could give me some assistance, I'd make it worth your while. Prentice was already standing to help. I mean, you two could stay here if you wish, for, wish to for a time. Let's not worry about that right yet, Prentice said. And if there is something else I could assist you with, perhaps. I, ignoring George, Prentice put a hand beneath his arm and lifted him in one swoop before the pain could set in. Just like that, Prentice said, slow, like, they walked as one through the trees with Landry trailing them. Though George needed the stars for guidance, it was all he could do to keep his sight straight ahead to stop him from falling over, from giving in to the pain. He placed his head in the nook where Prentice's chest met his shoulder and allowed the man to balance him. After some time he had passed, he asked if Prentice knew where they were. If this is your land, as you say it is, then I've seen your home, Prentice said. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? Not far from here. Not far at all. George realized as they reached the clearing how absolutely exhausted he was. At once, the entire night, which had been suspended in time, unspooled itself before him, and reality presented itself in the form of his log cabin standing before him, and the black outline of what could only be Isabel carved in the shadow against the front window can we can we make it prentice asked best you go in alone from here might we wait a few moments longer george asked you need to rest mr walker prentice pleaded there's nothing for you out here true but how unlike him it must have been the dehydration yes he was disoriented a few a bit confused and the tears were merely a symptom of his predicament. It was only a few of them at that. I'm not myself. Excuse me. Prentice held him. He did not let go. I don't... I haven't told her. 
is all, George said. I could not bear it. Told her what now? And George thought of the image August had left him with that morning of his boy abandoning the trenches he'd been dig he'd helped dig, so gripped with fear as to soil himself, to cower and run towards the Union line as though they might pity his screams of terror, might see him through the gut of smoke and grant his surrender and not shoot him down with the rest. It occurred to him that Caleb might have inherited some flawed trait from his father, for though for who was the bigger coward, the boy for dying without courage, or George for not being able to tell the boy, his own mother, that she would never see his her son again. Nothing, George said. I've been alone for such long periods. Sometimes I speak to myself. Prentice nodded as if some reason, as if some reasoning might be found in his words. That animal you spoke of, Mister Morton, taught me some tricks through the years tomorrow perhaps i can help you to track it there was pity in his words and george sensing the irony of a man living with so little offering him charity straightened himself up and harnessed what little energy he still possessed to regain his comp composure that won't be necessary he looked prentice over once considering that this might be the last time they ever laid eyes on each other I do appreciate your assistance, Prentice. You are a good man. Good night now. Good night, Mr. Walker. George hobbled to the front steps, the cold already slipping away from his bones before the front door had opened and the heat of the fire found him. For the slightest moment before going inside, he peered back at the forest, silent and void of life, in the dark, like there was nothing there at all. End of chapter one. I'm a little bit nervous. My my camera battery is flashing and that brings us to the end of first chapter fridays and i was reading from sweet water oh, sweet the sweetness of water by nathan harris thank you so very much for joining me and i love you very much for choosing me until next time don't forget to like share comment and subscribe bye now